This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 21, recorded November 21st, 2011. How about that? Episode 21, huh. recorded 1121. And last week was 11, 11, 11. Anyway, I digress. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today, from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And you? Well, I was musing, we were just musing for a moment uh, before starting this, that <clears throat> for us oldsters, a problem that has emerged is that biology is becoming full of mathematics. And I don't mean bioinformatics because I don't have to know how they do it, but I kind of understand what bioinformaticists try to do. I'm talking about people who make models by taking some relationship and extending it via complicated equations and making models where they plot their line and uh, show that the numbers fall right on the line. Mm -hmm. Some of that seems hard to me. Yeah, I know what you mean, but I do think that there will always be, or at least for a long time, there will always be a need for experiments. Oh, sure. That's right? true. Although, you yeah. know, some people uh, would like... All experiments one day to be virtual. Uh, in other words, in other words, we have so much data that we could predict what any given experiment could be. What do you think about that? Well, um, biology seems to sort of be endless. You take all the number of things that happen, and it's factorial. Mm. It's that many things that can happen, and so I don't know that uh, and that you don't want to explore the exploring may be likened to geography versus geology. You're looking sideways instead of down. But boy, there's a lot of exploring to do. So yeah, it's I'd be a shame if you didn't have a look. Yeah, I think we do discover brand new things all the time, which maybe would not fit uh, whatever models we are making. So maybe it's not I mean, the number of new things, I mean, just the, the stuff we're going to talk about today, the symbiosis, much of this is new. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, the, microbi the microbiome's relatively new, right. uh, so maybe it won't happen. But uh, don't listeners don't despair. There will always be room to do experiments. <laughs> maybe the math part is difficult. Uh, Michael Schmidt was not planning to be here today. He's on an airplane somewhere. Oh my! We'll miss him. We'll miss him. And uh, Joe Handelsman was supposed to be here, but couldn't make it. Maybe she will call in a bit later. So we'll start miss, without her. We'll miss, miss her, her, too. So it's you and me, Elio. Okay, that's a new one. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that. In fact, sometimes uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts where there are two people. I really like it. Okay. Because they have a good conversation. Good. So it'll be us. Now, Mike Schmidt, before we start, he, he sent me an email this morning. He regrets he can't be here. But he sent a link to images of viral desserts because he said the holidays are coming up. and. Oh. If people want to bake things, they can put them in the form of viruses. So I'll, po I'll post a link to the photos of viral desserts. All right. These that are actually, I, don't, I don't know if he knew this, but this was they're a, not these catching, are, <laughs> they're not infectious. These are um, pictures that I posted. I went to the Harvard Virology Program retreat back in September. And at that retreat, the students had a contest to see who could bake the best viral dessert. <laughs> so they made uh, cakes and cookies and all sorts of things in the form of viruses. So I took pictures of them and put them here. So they're very amusing. So make some viral holiday desserts. Okay, we have two papers today to talk about. They have little to do with viruses, though. They have little to do, as far as we know, right? Who knows? Right. Everything has to do with viruses. yes. <laughs> we just don't know about it. <laughs> and they both have to do, I guess we could say they both have to do with symbiosis, right? Absolutely. So let me start on mine. Sure. It's about worms. These are not just your average worms like an uh, earthworm or a tapeworm, but they are little tiny worms that live 
in the sandy bottoms of shallow waters in the oceans, which, by the way, looks like a desert. There's not much you see there. You see a few shallow, fish. meaning how how deep is shallow? Oh, uh, down to five meters, something like that. Hmm. Uh, I don't know exactly, but it's something like that. It's where, you know, the tide matters because uh, it's a big effect. Anyhow, it's uh, a lot of this looks like it's washed out of life. There's occasionally a fish or a crab may show up. But in reality, if you look at the sediments, they're full of life, full of bacteria and archaea and protists and everything else, and worms. And there's one kind of worms which um, are gutless and mouthless. They have no gut, they have no mouth. They belong to the flatworms, but as I say, they're very different from uh, your, your regular flatworms like, like tapeworms or flukes. Uh, they're only about a millimeter or two, a few millimeters long. And if you look at them, what you find that's sort of unusual is that they are filled, if you section them or do anything to it, they're filled with a tube which occupies about 90% of their body cavity, and that tube is full of bacteria, about 50% bacteria. So now you say, well, this must be endosymbionts, and what are they doing? Well, right away you could think about, let's think for a second about what else, where, what, where else do we see bacterial symbionts which are wall-to-wall -wall inside of their host cells? Can you think of some, Vincent? Wall-to-wall. Wall-to-wall bacteria. Just about wall-to-wall -wall bacteria. That's, there's hardly any room for anything else. I don't know. I just know the other worms that we talked about before on TWIM, which have bacteria in them as well. These are the ones that live down by the ocean vents. But right. I, don't, I don't think those are wall-to-wall. -wall. Wall. They're not wall-to-wall, -wall, but they're very full of them. Well, uh, root nodules come to mind. Ah, Not mm -hmm. animals, but they're plants. Mm -hmm. In root nodules, you find that the bacteroids, which are the degenerate form of the bacteria, of rhizobia and things like that, mm -hmm. are packed solid, really packed solid. Anyhow. So this worm, this has, worm is basically, packed, it's basically a sack of bacteria? <laughs> it's basically a sack of bacteria. So why do, we call, why do we call it a worm then? <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> If you do the ultra thin sectioning on it, you find that it's got a nervous system. Uh -huh, okay. It's got this and that. It's got all kinds of things, muscles, but it doesn't have a respiratory system. It doesn't have a circulatory system. So yeah. what's going on here? The other thing that's a hint about what may be going on is that they are white. These worms are white in color. And when you look in the microscope, what you find is that they're white because they have granules, which by analysis with fancy machines turn out to be sulfur. So now they, you immediately know what, where, where this is leading to. It's leading to the fact that like in other symbiosis, we're probably looking here at uh, sulfide reduction as a, an autotrophic way of life. This is something that many bacteria carry out they take H2S and convert it into sulfur and carbohydrates. This is an autotrophic way of life. As I say, it's quite widespread. And it's, in fact, the same thing you find in the tube worms in the uh, deep water rifts. So they take, you said they take hydrogen sulfide. Mm -hmm. Which Where do they get that from? Okay, hydrogen sulfide is found two ways. One is natural seeps from deep in the in the earth this mm -hmm. h2s being formed i don't quite know i don't know much about that but also biologically because when you have the composition anaerobic decomposition especially you find that the sulfur and amino acids like cysteine and methionine get converted in h2s this is why rotten eggs smell like rotten eggs the smell is h2s okay anyhow you take this h2s and it's fuel you can burn it you can burn it by oxidizing it. And in this case, as in some other cases, like in the tube worms, the oxidant is oxygen. Mm -hmm. I'll remind you that seawater, down to quite some depth, is half saturated with oxygen. Mm -hmm. okay. So there's plenty of oxygen. They're not, not, well, I shouldn't say that because the solubility is very low, but it's still a fair amount. So they take uh, the H2S and they make sulfur out of it, you said? They make sulfur out of it, and they use the electrons to um, 
we lose carbon dioxide and essentially make carbohydrates and everything mm. else. And this is what they feed their host. Mm. In other words, if you were to treat these worms with antibiotics that kill the bacteria, they would starve to death in no time. Now, that's, as I say, it's not terribly new in itself because you have other cases. But there are a couple of, you know, a couple of things here which are different. One of them is that in the majority of cases where you find <clears throat> sulfide oxidation, it's carried out, and this, by the way, is not just inside of um, hosts which carry symbionts, but it's when, when everything decomposes, say when eggs decompose, when a, a tree decomposes, when, when a dead fish decomposes, bacteria carry this out. And they're mainly proteobacteria, you know, a large group of gram-negative bacteria, and they're all in the gamma or epsilon proteobacteria. So these uh, here, these are different. They are alpha proteobacteria. And while this may just be a taxonomic quirk, may not sound too interesting, except to remind you that the alpha proteobacteria include two celebrated kinds of endosymbionts, namely the rhizobia, which we mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. and the rickettsia, which cause typhus and cause spotted fevers and other diseases like that. And they are <clears throat> strict intracellular parasites. And we talked about those, right? We talked about With those. The white flies That's and right. the mealy bugs. Yep. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> In addition, I'll remind you that if you look at where mitochondria come from, you know, there, there's not much DNA in mitochondria, but what there is looks like it's derived from the alpha proteobacteria. In fact, the closest thing to mitochondria, to the DNA the mitochondria have, is what you find in rickettsia. So this is kind of interesting, just an oddity. Maybe it means something, maybe it leads someplace. But in these gutless worms, the symbionts are alpha proteobacteria. Well, the bacteria, by the way, are quite large. They are five to eight microns in diameter. I mean, that is like huge. And I don't know what that means. Just don't ask because I don't know. But you find that actually when in the, um, yeah, in the mealworms, you find that there were huge bacteria as well. So this may be something which we don't quite appreciate, but namely that uh, endosymbiotic bacteria can be, don't have to be, but can be very large. Can I ask you a more a general question? Um, so these are saltwater worms, obviously. Right. Right. And the worms bam, down by the vents that we talked about on another twim, that was Nicole Dubillier's work, um, the salt water also. And there are many examples of salt water symbioses in various like bivalves and uh, worms Absolutely. and protists, right? Are there freshwater examples? Oh, you're throwing me a curve. It's okay. Uh, you, you can say I don't know. I, I can say I don't know because that's exactly right. I would be, I would be very surprised if they weren't. Though. Yeah. That's, okay. Because, uh, yeah, I have a wonderful review article here that Nicole Dubillier wrote uh, in Nature Reviews Microbiology. It's about symbiotic diversity in marine animals. And it's marine animals. You know, mm. So I just wondered if no, well, fresh water... Uh, Oh, I've heard of freshwater symbiosis. I just, they just don't come to mind. I'm sure they, there are plenty, plenty of them. Uh, the sediments of lakes are such rich places for, for life. There's so much distinct life, and they're anaerobic as all get out. So this, the process we're talking about, by the way, are, are aerobic. They require oxygen, but you can also carry out a sulfide reduction using other uh, electron acceptors. Anyhow, so I, okay. I'd be very surprised if the, a lot of this stuff wouldn't happen in, in uh, freshwater lakes as well. Okay. Yeah, probably one of our listeners will uh, answer us with, uh, with the answer. That would be great. Be nice. <laughs> sure. So let me tell you a little bit about how these people went about studying this. There's a group of um, investigators based some partly in, in Austria, partly in Germany, partly in Italy. So this paper, this particular paper is very international. But the Austrian seems to have a school of endosymbionts and of microbial ecology that's quite nice and I don't, I didn't, not necessarily so visible, so I'm glad to mention it. Anyhow, so you find these worms, you find that they're full of sulfur, you find they're full of bacteria. So now you say, well, I, I, I can smell <laughs> if the pun, I can smell the H2S having a role here, but what's really going on? So they, um, by the way, the elemental sulfur makes up between 
five to twenty percent of the tissue mass. Mm. So you know, there's a lot there. So this this obviously must mean something. This is always so turning over, though, right? The sulfur. Is, uh, no, isn't no, it no, used to an, an no, electron transport? It. No. No, there is of there are of course bacteria that can take sulfur and and carry it further and oxidize it to sulfuric acid, but that's not what's not these guys. Here. So these so think. the sulfur just stays there. It doesn't. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. It's not a problem. Yeah. Not a problem. I well, I don't know if it's not a problem, but it stays there. Hmm. Uh, but doesn't so, as as it as they reduce or oxidize H two S, doesn't it accumulate more and more? Yeah, sulfur and yeah. Well, maybe they, they shed they, some of it, they right? Them, maybe they shed some of mm, it, right? Okay. Uh, there are similar things you find in the um, giant bacteria of the coast of Namibia, Thio Margarita. Uh, that's this giant bug that you can see with your naked eyes, micron across almost, mm -hmm. and it's uh, called Thio Margarita, which means sulfur pearl. Margarita is Latin for pearl, sulfur pearl because you look they look they're white and they look they look like sulfur. Anyhow, I didn't know margarita meant pearl. Don't tell me I never taught you anything, Vincent. No, you know I, if I drink a margarita, I'm drinking pearls, huh? <laughs> when you acquire pearls of wisdom in the process, I'm you're acquiring that. margaritas. Okay. Okay. Anyhow, let's go back to what else the worms have besides having sulfur. When you look at the genome, they contain. Uh, several enzymes which are very telling. One is a subunit of a thing called the dissimilatory sulfide reductase, which is a key enzyme in this process. It works in reverse because it participates in sulfate reduction as well, but in this case, it um, oxidizes sulfide. And they have this gene. And they also have a gene for a, an enzyme called the aden adenosine 5 prime phosphosulfate reductase, which makes, as you would guess, adenosine phosphosulfate, which is also involved in sulfur energy metabolism. So these are two key enzymes in, in what you expect to see if you're talking about sulfide reduction. And then they have Robisco, you know, the main player in autotrophic carbon fixation, which is universal. It's said to be, by the way, uh, Rubisco is said to be the most abundant enzyme in the world. Did you know that? No, not at all. This is ribulose biphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, right? Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you didn't look it up, did you? No, I, I remember that, but I didn't know it was... Uh so abundant. It's said to be, well, it's in all the plants and it's all the autotrophic organisms, photosynthetic or chemosynthetic. So uh, I think at least. Anyhow, it's, a, it's there. So you have these three enzymes and you have sulfur and you simply go ahead and presume that what happens here is that the bacteria take up H2S from their environment. I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. And oxidize it, making sulfur and carbohydrates, mm -hmm. and that this is what the worm lives on because well, perhaps the worm gets in some food uh, through its cuticle, but this seems unlikely because water is not exactly full of, seawater is not full of nutrients. So this is probably the main way in which the organism acquires its, um, its, uh, its nutrients, mm -hmm. the, the worm. So happy, happy worm, a happy worm is a worm full of bugs. So the the they the title of this paper is Paracatenula. Right, that's and the name of the worm. That's the name of the worm. Right, and they they say an ancient symbiosis between thiotrophic alpha proteobacteria and catenulid flatworms. That's what they are, catenulids. Okay, so Paracatenula is the uh, genus, right? It's, no, it's the class, I think. Or no, not the class. The what's below class order. Order. Yeah, something like that. Catenulid worms are well known. Not all of them are of in this group. That is, some of them have a gut and have a mouth, but these don't. So they, so this uh, the bacteria. Are they all one species in each worm, or are they many? Yeah, they, they're yeah, one well, species. They, they look at different worms, and they have different species. And let me tell you the the fun part now. Yeah. They do. Uh, they um, look at the uh, 16s ribosomal RNA of the bacteria, and they build a dendrogram, you know, one of those branch trees mm -hmm. that shows you where how related they are, and they're all kind of related. And then they do the same thing with the worm species, only instead of 16S, of course, they have to use eukaryotic ribosomes, which have 18S and 28S RNA. So now they have this tree, 
Pretend, pretend you have, you're extending your hand and you splay your fingers mm -hmm. on your right hand, okay? Okay. But we don't have video, so we're going to have to do it imaginatively. So on the, on the right hand, you have a dendrogram for the bacteria. On the left hand, again, do the same thing. Open up your fingers. You have a dendrogram for the worms. Now put your fingertips together mm -hmm. and they match, mm -hmm. okay? So the two dendrograms fit together. What does this mean? This is, by the way, it has a name. It's called co Cladogenesis. Wow. Formation of clads together. Okay. So the clay, clays, I guess, is, uh, that's how one says it. So what this says is that it looks like they evolved together. Mm -hmm. In other words, one changed, the other one changed. Okay. And they go on and they all seem to be, have this, this pattern of evolution that matches both host and symbiont. Hmm. So that's nice. Now, this is known, co-cladogenesis is not new. In fact, Nancy Moran uh, published this a long time ago for some uh, insect and the symbionts. And it serves, it serves in various ways. One of the ways it serves to, you can use this as a clock because you have some ideas to when these events happen by the distance. And so you can use this as a way of saying how far ago, how long ago did these things happen. Mm -hmm. and the exciting thing here is that they think the despairing, in other words, the establishment of the symbiosis, took place between 500 to 620 million years ago. Wow. If, that, if you believe that, this is the oldest known symbiosis between bacteria and metazoans. So this is another example of, of, of the fun that you can have symbiotes. Oh, let me go back. I still have to talk about one thing. This arrangement of using uh, H2S and oxidizing it using oxygen has a problem. H2S is not found much in seawater. It's found only in the lowest layers, in the sediments. And oxygen is not found there because the sites are anaerobic. So how do they do this? So they don't know. But uh, they believe that these worms must migrate. In other words, they must migrate from below where they pick up the H2S and they migrate above where they pick up the oxygen. Mm -hmm. And uh, this reminds me of something that is really pretty phenomenal. We're going to change the subject here. We're, we're talking about sulfide reducting, reducing bacteria, but not symbionts, the free living. Now, get this. Off, uh, in certain places where there's shallow waters, notably off the coast of Ch Chile, there is an immense growth of what looks like tiny thin filaments. It covers the size of Greece, somebody said. Okay, since I'm uh, in North America, I translate this to the size of the state of Montana. Okay, that's how much there is just off the coast of Chile. What are these guys? These guys are bacteria which live in sheaths. They make sheets of polysaccharides themselves, and they, some of the sheets contain more than one bacteria. The bacteria are filamentous, long filaments. And guess what they do? They travel up and down the sheet, like taking an elevator to work. Down below, they pick up the H2S. Up above, they pick up the oxygen. They're in the sand, these bacteria? And these are in the sand. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Incredible. I mean, talk, talk about things that you would miss yeah. if you just did mathematics or just did uh, modeling. Amazing. Anyhow, this is, this is as big an area of life, of prokaryotic life, as you're likely to find in, in contiguous places. It's just an amazing thing. Anyhow, so the worms. The worms have the same problem. We don't know how to solve this. Oh, oh and I still have to give you another example. You know about Thio margarita. Mm -hmm. This is the biggest bug known, the biggest bacterium known, which is found off the coast of Namibia. That's why it's called Thio margarita namibiensis. Just talked about that. Well, it has a fantastic arrangement for uh, carrying its oxidant. Namely, it's huge, not because the cell itself is so huge. It's really just a thin layer surrounding a vacuole, and the vacuole is full of nitrate. Now, nitrate is like oxygen. You can use that as an oxidant for H2S. So this guy has like a scuba tank <laughs> carrying its <laughs> oxidant. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> It, it needs to fill it up. It goes down to the bottom where the nitrate is. It needs, then mm. it goes up, uh, up its merry way. Anyhow, nice. these are all clever things that microbes have to do. And this is, this is about it for the story. Uh, I want to give you one more thing. Uh, the bacteria has a name. It's called Candidatus Rigeria Galatea. And hmm. the, the genus name, Rigeria, is after the zoologist, Reinhard Rieger, who described the host genus. Anyhow, uh, 
candidatus. Do you know what it means? Have you run into that? Candidate? Yeah, candidate of what? Let me tell you. By, by the rules of microbial taxonomy, you cannot name a bacterium by genus and species unless you can cultivate it. Ah, that's right. Yes. Okay? <laughs> now, candidatus means a candidate trying to get in there, but yeah. waiting to be cultivated. Well, this is borders on the absurd because for a couple of reasons. First of all, some bacteria you cannot possibly cultivate is mm -hmm. that these highly reduced endosymbionts, there's no way you're going to cultivate them. The other is that in some cases, you may have even the complete genome sequence of the organism, even if you can't grow it. <laughs> so now you're in the odd position that, yes, of course, it'd be nice to be able to grow it. But on the other hand, you know as much as you want to know about it. You mm. know a tremendous amount. So what... Um, you have to change you know, the but, rules. Yeah, you got to change the rules. I mean, the who, candidate who, is... Who's in nice. charge of this naming business? The Well, the, there's, there's an international... Commissioner of Microbial Taxonomy, and they, they have to accept the, yeah, what's happening yeah. in the modern world. The, um, I just had a question, and now it's, it's, it's going away. Oh, it was such a good one, too. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what was the area? Maybe I can, maybe uh, I can help. It was a really good question. Now, because I'm an old guy, I can't remember it. Anyway, so um, you can't grow these these. Uh, Regaria at all in culture, right? No, um, not yet. Well, I don't know. Uh, I know. I remembered it now. Story. Very little is known about uh, it. Do we know the genome of this bug? Is it reduced so that it, that uh, it's getting things from the host? I was asking myself that. I don't think it's been published. I don't think they know yet. Because mm -hmm. you remember but, the uh, uh, the Rickettsia in the mealy bug has a very reduced genome and gets a lot of help from the mealy bug, right? That's right. That's it may right. be the same case here, right? Well, it's entirely possible, in which case it would be a uh, mutual symbiosis where both benefit. Yeah, true mutualism, yeah. But that's Very probably possible. published. So uh, I think so. I don't think I know. Ah. So the fact that um, this reduces, or oxidizes, sorry, oxidizes H2S is implied from the, uh, the, the genome analysis, right? It's not proven Pretty experimentally. And the presence of the sulfur granules, which right. can come, unless, unless you do something like this. It's, that seems, by and large, I think that's pretty solid. I, I, would, I would put money on that. Would anyone bother to do the experiment and actually show that uh, uh, these, this can uh, happen? Or is that not worth doing? Sure. I think you can probably, th that sounds doable. Do, yeah. take, take the worms, give them some sulfur-labeled H2S, which is yeah. easy to come by. And then uh, analyze the sulfur granules for the isotope content. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that. Be a fun experiment to do, I think. And the and H2S, as you said, is is kind of deeper in the sand, right? It's not right on the. Right. That's right. So the worms have to go get it. Uh, well, that's that's what they pose it. They mm -hmm. don't really know. They haven't seen them crawl. And they, uh, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Do they crawl? <laughs> they crawl. Yeah, yeah. They, they have they have muscles. Mm -hmm. Figure three is a really nice picture it's a laser scanning confocal micrograph oh, yeah. right yeah nice you can see the worm full of of these bacteria they're different colors and you're right there's just like a thin membrane around them That's right. that is the worm uh you had mentioned there's they're 500 million years is, is when they think this was established, this symbiosis, yeah. right? That, I'll remind you, that's really the beginning of metazoan life. Was around, I don't know exactly, but it was, you know, not certainly not much earlier. Uh, so this may go back to the beginning of uh, metazoans, multicellular animals and plants. It makes sense like that, that. Uh, yeah, it's, that starts yeah. to evolve. And then you right yeah. away you have these symbioses forming. Why? Isn't that amazing? I mean, really, when you think about it, you would think symbiosis is so complicated. It must evolve slowly, you know, it must take eons and eons to develop. And here it is, you know, it comes with the territory. Yeah. Well, that's a great story. You like okay. symbioses, right? Yes, we do. <laughs> so that paper was by, oh, a lot of authors. Gruber yes. Vodica is the first author in Jorg Ott. You know any of these? Do you know Jorg Ott? I'm sorry, I don't know. Ott is a name I recognize. He's published a lot in this field. He's, he's from, uh, let's see, which university in Austria? Let me just look it up. It's uh, University of Vienna. I think it's University of Vienna. Yeah. Indeed it is. 
Yep. Yeah. There's yeah. also the some Department of Marine Biology. I don't know how they, how they do marine biology in Vienna. They have to travel through yeah, the they Adriatic, take, don't they? They take field trips, yeah. Take field trips, that's right. Well, also, yeah, there's a lot, uh, lot of people in Illinois who do marine biology. So, yeah. you know, why not? Well, uh, Elizabeth McFall Nye, oh, sure. she's now in Wisconsin, and she just takes trips to Hawaii. That's right. There's also uh, people on this paper from Bremen, the, in, the Max Planck Institute for yeah. Marine Microbiology. Oh, that's a big place. That's a very important place. I think Nicole Dubillier was there for a while. Oh, yes. Well, I think that's right. Okay, yeah. very good. Nice All paper. Right. Okay, the second one is another PNAS paper. And this one is by Jane Luo and Blank, and it is called Helicobacter pylori vacuolating cytotoxin A, which is called VAC-A, engages the mitochondrial fission machinery to induce host cell death. And this is, you said, uh, Elio, you're, it's one of your favorite symbionts, the mitochondrion, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Which we just mentioned. Yeah, you, has, you said it has, the, the DNA that it does have is, makes it an alpha proteobacteria. Yeah. yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. So everyone knows mitochondria, but maybe, and they know them well because they're involved in energy production. But maybe what everyone doesn't know, they also do other things. They uh, they regulate calcium. They're involved in apoptosis or apoptosis, and I know that well because viruses mess with that process. And they also do other things. Uh, apoptosis, of course, is programmed cell death. Uh, many pathogens induce it, and um, it's it's usually a defense against many pathogens. Although viruses as can take advantage of it. Yeah, viruses can, in fact, get rid of apoptosis. They want to yeah, so viruses that take a long... Explain that. Explain so that some viruses person. that take a long time to replicate want to, want to inhibit apoptosis so that they can complete their replication cycles. Mm -hmm. So apoptosis... They want the host to stay alive. Yeah, right? they do. Apoptosis will kill the host, and the idea is that uh, that's sort of a defense mechanism uh, to prevent uh, the spread of the virus. If you kill the host or the cell before the virus can replicate, that's a good... Uh, mechanism. So many viruses interfere with the uh, development of apoptosis at many levels. It's a very complicated pathway, and viruses make gene products that interfere. Of course, apoptosis is also important for development. And a good example is when you when you, your fingers and toes develop mm. very early on. The cells between them apoptose, and that gives you individual <laughs> fingers and toes. Some viruses that replicate really quickly actually prolong apoptosis as a means to get out of cells. Uh-huh. So they kill the cell, you're now free to yeah. infect other cells. The viruses can get out. Yeah. Now, in this case, Helicobacter pylori, which we've talked about before, being involved in uh, stomach ulcers and, and cancers, but even in protecting people against asthma, so both a good <laughs> and a bad bacterium. Uh, these... Um, these bacteria, uh, the chronic infections with them are, is associated with apoptosis in the stomach. So it's known that this uh, bacterium is, is associated with apoptosis. And uh, this paper deals with a exotoxin called VAC-A, vacuolating cytotoxin A. Originally, it was found to cause these big vacuoles inside of cells, eukaryotic cells, that is, when you add helicobacter to them. So the... Uh, the story that we need to know so far here is that this toxin targets mitochondria. So uh, it's released from the helicobacter. It binds the membrane of eukaryotic cells. It's taken up into the cell, and it then uh, targets the mitochondria. And it has been known previously to, to affect the permeability of the mitochondrial outer membrane. It's the mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization, or MOMP, and this is altered by VAC-A. And that's not a good thing to mess with the uh, mm. permeability of the mitochondrial membrane because all of the transport yes. processes that occur there depend on having an intact membrane, of course. And as we'll see in a moment... Well, they, you, you can't do um, all the good things that mitochondria do unless you have an intact membrane. That's right. So. The other things that it's happen. The business end of the mitochondria. If you if you make the mitochondrial membrane permeable, cytochrome C comes out, and that induces apoptosis. So that is one of the mechanisms by which uh, you start ap apoptotic 
processes. Okay. Vincent, have you ever thought about why mitochondria are involved in apoptosis? Is there anything obvious? I have never thought about it, so I, but I wonder, you know, why, why isn't it the nucleus that's involved? Why is it the mitochondria? Yeah, I, don't, I have thought about it. Yeah, many people have, and I don't, I don't think we have an answer for that. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, maybe the nucleus is too busy. He's <laughs> yeah, doing a lot of other things. Okay, fair enough. So in this paper, what they have have basically is a cell system. They were just monolayers of eukaryotic cells of different kinds. And if you add uh, these helicobacter pylori to them, and they look at the mitochondria, you can stain mitochondria with a dye. In, no in normal cells, the mitochondria actually form these filaments, uh, which is really new to me. I never saw mitochondria look looked at in this way. I don't know if you knew this before, Elio. Did you know that uh, they form filaments? Not only do they, yeah, well, I kind of did. Um, but not only do they form filaments, but they actually make networks. Networks, the yeah. Filaments are nastomos. Yeah. And so they make like a meshwork. Yeah, it's a mesh. It's yeah. actually a mesh. And actually, we have an email about that later. Someone's uh -huh. asking us about that. If you add helicobacter to these cells, so you just take the medium off the cells and you add helicobacter, and you incubate for a while, and then you wash off the bacteria and you put medium on, within two to eight hours, these, these networks of mitochondria go away and they're replaced by punctate-staining mitochondria, which is presumably mm. clumps of, uh, of mitochondria. So the bacteria disperse uh, the mitochondrial network. Mm -hmm. They really break it up. Don't they break they? it up, yeah. yeah. And um, if you treat, you can also do the same thing. You can break up this network with culture medium from the bacteria. So it must yeah, be that's kinda neat. something released from the bacteria is doing this. And if you heat the medium with at 95 degrees, you destroy this activity, which suggests that you know, it's some kind of protein factor uh, that is involved. <laughs> I was amused to see that there's an argument in the year of our Lord of 2011. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of a little bit of an old-fashioned way of putting it. That if you, if you heat, heat it, it, yeah. it, it really goes away, it's likely to be a protein. Yeah. That's okay. It's fine, because they go beyond that, of course, and <laughs> right. show it. But So then they do some genetics, and they, they focus on VAC-A, because it's known that um, – VAC-A has some mitochondrial targeting properties, and we've already seen here that the mitochondrial network is uh, dispersed. So they, they make a deletion of, of VAC-A. And in fact, if you take these bacteria with the gene deleted uh, and add them to cells, you don't see this disruption of this mm -hmm. uh, fibrillar network. And also, if you put it back via plasmid, you recover the activity, which is standard genetics. Standard to make sure you didn't do anything else when you right. deleted it, exactly. right? Yeah, we yeah. do the same with viruses as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is telling us that VAC-A is involved here. Then they express the protein, VAC-A protein, and purify it. And if you add that to cells, it will also cause this uh, disruption of the networks of mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And then they, they divide the protein into two parts. There's a 33,000 molecular weight and 55,000, and they show that uh, neither one alone does the, net, the network. You have to have both of them together. So it's a purified protein that's able to do this, and they look at the concentration that you need to do this and so forth. Okay, so what is the mechanism of this? What is VAC-A doing? They try and do some experiments to address that. And one thing that we should point out is that mitochondria don't exist statically in the cell. They're always... They're always dividing and fusing, and they undergo apoptosis as kind of a quality control uh, mechanism. Yeah, by the way, this is this is something that's worth mm -hmm. staying with for a second. This um, incredible plasticity of mitochondria is sort of really unusual in biology. I mean, these are like uh, globs of stuff that get together, then they, they separate, they right. divide. I mean, it's, it's really so different than their ancestors' bacteria. I don't. I hardly know of any bacteria that fuse, that have the ability to fuse. I mean, they may have cell-to-cell -cell communication, but the actual fusion, I just never heard of it. And so here's something that these X bacteria have learned to do. Uh, and they do it in style. I mean, they really do it on a vast scale. Fusing, yeah. binding, splitting in half, and all that. Not in half. They don't split in half. There's no binary fission in mitochondria. There's fission, but you wouldn't call it binary fission. Right. 
So this this network of mitochondria, you see that in bacteria. They make meshes of similar similar types, right? Well, no, that's what I'm saying. You don't. You don't see bacteria fusing. Not fused, meshes, but they make meshes. I don't think so. Well, these these meshes that you were talking about in the ocean, those are made of carbohydrates. No, no. Right? no those are those are sheaths within the bacteria. The bacteria within the sheaths. Yeah. They're not. They're not. They're not on osmosing. So this uh, this property of mitochondria is something that was acquired in the eukaryotic cell. Yeah, evolved so. there. Yeah. Yeah. So this um, fission is regulated by a protein in the mitochondria. It's called DRP1, and this uh, DRP1 forms structures that that uh, are, go along with fission. And when they found that when you add VACA to cells, you get more DRP localization uh, in in the mitochondria. Can I interrupt you? Yeah, please? sure. Let me interrupt. Uh, the uh, DRP1, which is a dyna, what is the, the dynanin uh, related protein, mm -hmm. um, works in a very funny way. This is a protein that makes uh, polymerizes, makes long spirals, right? And the spirals sort of turn themselves around the mitochondria and they squeeze. It's like a snake squeezing a prey. That's right. Uh, so it's really an amazing thing. And eventually this leads to fission, leads to the splitting of the mitochondria. Right. It's an amazing process. And this is stimulated by VAC-A. Right. When you add VAC-A to cells, you get more recruitment of DRP1 and more squeezing and more fission. And all of the mutants and so forth of VAC-A that they have don't do this. They have, You need an intact VAC-A protein in order to increase the recruitment of DRP1. So it looks like the, the mechanism of VAC-A involves messing with this uh, fission machinery uh, of the mitochondria via DRP1. Now, DRP1 is also a GTPase, so it hydrolyzes GTP, and the energy is probably uh, is in, is required for its function. This Which is typical of many uh, structural proteins. That's right. In the cell, cytoskeletal proteins, and this is related to that. Right, and there is actually an inhibitor of this protein that's called MDV1, and MDV1 blocks uh, the assembly of DRP1 into these spirals that uh, Elio was talking about. It also inhibits GTPase activity and prevents mitochondrial fission. And so the stimulatory effect of VAC-A on a DRP1 and fission is inhibited, is blocked by MDV1. So if you add back A and MDV1 to cells, you don't get this uh, recruitment of DRP and, and fission of the mitochondria. So that tells you that the DRP1 GTPase activity uh, is required for the effect of uh, VAC A on the mitochondria. The other thing that's important to talk a little bit about here is uh, there is a a protein called B BCL2 in uh, eukaryotic cells. And BCL2 is a regulator, a very important regulator of apoptosis. And it has many so-called effectors, that is, proteins that uh, carry out its bidding, if, if you will. And I really shouldn't say bidding because bid is one of the proteins involved. But um, <laughs> another one is called BAX, B-A-X. It's a, an effector, a pro-apoptotic effector of BCL2. And they find in this paper that if they add VAC-A to cells, they, they see a, a decrease, uh, an inactivation of BACs in the presence of the MDV1 inhibitor. Um, and without the inhibitor, they see activation of BACs by VAC-A. So it looks like that uh, uh, VAC-A may be working through BACs, but it works before it. In other words, you add VAC-A to cells, and you get a stimulation of fission, and then VAX is activated. So, so far we've talked about how VAC-A affects the filamentous structure of the mitochondria, uh, and then we talked about um, its effect on um, DRP1 and fission. And ne next they look at actual cell death, that is apoptotic cell death induced by VAC-A. So they assay specifically for that. So if you add, again, VAC-A to cells you induce cell death. If you add VAC-A in the presence of MDV1, which again is the inhibitor of DRP1, you block the increase in cell death. So VAC-A causes cell death that is dependent 
on DRP1, which is, of course, again, this protein that stimulates the fission of mitochondria. And the last experiment is that they show that VACA forms membrane channels that are important for this activity. So it's previously been shown that VACA targets the mitochondria and makes channels. It permeabilizes the outer membrane of the mitochondria. And they have two mutants of the toxin that cannot form these membrane channels. And in fact, if you add these mutants to cells, these mutant proteins or altered proteins to cells, you do not see activation of BACs and you do not see an increase in cell death. Okay? So the proteins of VACA that are altered in their ability to for, to permeabilize the outer membrane of the mitochondria don't have this ability to mm-hmm. induce cell death and um, stimulate BACs. So the idea is that this toxin is getting to the mitochondria, binding to the mitochondria wall, permeabilizing it, recruiting DRP1, and those two activities are important for the induction of uh, apoptosis or cell death. So it's, I think it's really the first time that a uh, specific uh, bacterial protein has been shown to interact with the apoptotic path or a mitochondria this way to uh, influence uh, apoptosis. And the, the exact mechanism isn't known yet. We just know these descriptions that we've talked about in this paper. Yeah, but this is pretty important stuff. I mean, this is opening the door to where you want to look now. Absolutely. Yeah, because, and we should probably point out that apoptosis is believed to be an important um, component of disease caused by H. pylori. So if you can understand how it is induced, then you might have ways to antagonize it. I guess currently you treat H. You treat pylori with antibiotics, right? That's right. So maybe you would, you would have uh, some other drugs that you could use that were more specific that, that target this in, in particular. Good thought. So it's a very uh, interesting nice paper. paper. I yeah, I enjoyed reading it. Um, New insights on bacterial and uh, eukaryotic cell interactions. Now, if I understand correctly, the the H. pylori never get in the cells, right? That's right. They're not. I guess they're not known to be intracellular, but yeah. they might. But yeah. So these these effects are all through this toxin. In fact, this toxin back a, uh, I was reading a review article, has many many other effects on the cell. It does. Right. It's really amazing, and that's this so called multifunctional. Um, Toxins, not the only one, there are many others as well, but mm-hmm. uh, it does many things. That yeah, it, sure. It's incredible. So that's it, uh, Elio's favorite symbiont. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Can I change the subject? You can, sure. I'm, I'm making an observation about scientific writing and about how I read papers. Mm-hmm. This has nothing to do with the content of this paper. This paper is a good example. Let me tell you what happens when I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, in my old age, I'm not getting any more patient. So my reading is a little bit selective, and I can't read everything from top to bottom. Okay, this, So hey, this is what I do. Uh, result sections... After reading the, I read the introduction carefully because that tells me a lot about the paper. But when I get to the results, there's an awful lot of stuff that I don't need to know. I mean, there's a lot of, usually you see a lot of gels, a lot of images, a lot of this and that. So what I do is taking advantage of the fact that most papers, the results section are written in segments, in sections. I go to the end. I go to the end of the section And I read what it says, because if the paper is well written, the end of each section will be a, will have a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Each section is like a mini paper. Each section presents a certain number of facts, and then derives a conclusion. So now I I go to the end, like in this case, let me show you, let me read what it says. These results support the idea that VACA is essential for HP-dependent mitochondrial fragmentation. I know what they're going to say above it. That's right. Okay, so if I want to read it, I do. If I don't want to read it, I already know what the, what the conclusion is with regard to that. And I can, as I say, if I want to take the time and I need to do it, I read it in carefully, and otherwise I don't. So what this says, for all the listeners who are in the process of writing papers and cussing out because they don't like to be doing it, let me tell you to pay attention to the last sentence of each section of the result section. <laughs> How's yeah, that? Here they are very good at that. Every yeah, very good. This every is our, section has a summary at the end. These results suggest or indicate in every section. But not every paper does that. That's right. And when they don't, they lose my attention. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, I I say, well, there's more here than I want to know, and uh, goodbye. Yeah. Uh, so if 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 a writer wants my attention, it would for my purposes, it pays to do this. But it, look, it makes sense for every possible other reason as well. You, good scientific writing has. Uh, every 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 part of a paper should have a a logic to it, which includes yeah, yeah. like the old, the old statement is you're gonna tell him, you're gonna tell him, then you tell him, then you tell him, you told him, right? Yeah. Now, now the it's a good contrast is the first paper on the yeah. paracatenula, which has a combined results and discussion section, oh, yeah. and there it's harder because they don't have any of these kinds of statements. They just have some results, and then they start discussing them in each paragraph. Yeah, so, and you don't know what the what the paragraph above said. Yeah, you know, just, uh, what what this does for me, this end paragraph, end sentence, is it's, it's a shortcut. Yeah, I agree. It's not, I, do you read the discussions in these papers? What do you get from that? Yeah, I usually do because the discussion is really sort of kind of the fun part, you know. Yeah. But uh, often, often, you know, it's the discussion is has to justifying to the end uh, why they make that such and such a statement. And, yeah. You know, a lot of it is talking. There at that point, they're only talking with their competitors. <laughs> yeah. You know. I, I don't care why they you know that they have five reasons for making the statement when one is yeah, good enough. Yeah. What I don't like in discussions is when they repeat the results. Yeah. You no, know, they say yeah, right. we have shown this and this and this and this. Yeah, I know you've already told me you just this is <laughs> supposed to be where you're saying how does this work or what should we do next or what does this mean in the big picture, right? Mm, exactly. But there are no rules. Way, this brings up something else in communication. Um, there's a guy at UC uh, San Diego, uh, Jim Golden, who was in cyanobacteria. And uh, I heard him tell a student, who was, give a presentation, how one should treat each slide. And he made the following observation. Treat each slide as if it were a paper. Say what the purpose of the slide is. Say how you did it. Say what you found, and then conclude something about it. And I thought the same order, the same logic that pertains to a whole paper pertains to a single slide. That's true. Results. I, I fully That's agree. True. Very good. Very good. I, I fully agree. I tell my students all the time, because often they'll just show a slide and tell you the conclusion, but we don't know the experiment. Right. You have to tell often us. You, you will, you, there's no indication of what the ordinance mean. Yeah. What's on the x-axis? What's on the y-axis? You have to ask to find out. Exactly. Yeah. Treat it like a paper. That's a good point. I like that. I'm going to write that down here so I don't forget. <laughs> Treat each slide like a paper. That was Jim Golden? Jim Golden. Very good. All right. Let's. How about if we do a couple of emails? Why not? The first one is from Casey, who writes, Dear Twimmers, Thank you for taking the time to produce these podcasts free of charge. I hope this style of science podcasting continues to inspire other scientists into creating similar podcasts. On TWIM number 17, you discussed the discovery that mealybugs have symbionts within symbionts, which you guys related to the mitochondria. Until this year, I was consistently taught that mitochondria are individual sausage-shaped organelles. Due to their size, shape, and molecular data, they appeared to be a bacterium that was phagocytosed. However, Elio, he, he writes phagocytized. Is that the correct word, or is it phagocytosed? I would say phagocytized, but I'm okay. no expert. No, you are an expert, no? Oh, my. On the English <laughs> language, no? Oh, my God. However, I've come now to learn that mitochondria are truly a reticulum, similar to the endoplasmic reticulum. Interestingly, this information was known as early as 1980 when Ezatola Kehani from Tehran, Iran, published a paper, Observations on the Mitochondrial Reticulum in Candida, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. describing it as a branched reticulum. The shape commonly used in textbooks is really just cross-sections through the reticulum. So, right. Elia, what is a reticulum? It's uh, Well, it's what we talked about. I didn't call it the reticulum, call it a network, but it's the same yeah. thing. It's a meshwork of mitochondria. Mitochondria are not little sausages floating around. They are like a bunch of spaghetti linked end-to-end -end or something like that. Well, no, cross-linked, cross as it were. Uh, it's an amazing structure. And the mitochondria uh, in this are fused, right? They are fused. That's right. They are, they, they are. It's possible. I don't know that anybody knows, but the a reticulum may be a single mitochondrion, as it were. That's right. 
That's may right. be, or there could be several reticula uh -huh. in a given cell. I believe in yeast there's only one. So the mitochondrion that we think of, that we saw in the drawings, I mean, uh, Casey is totally right. I mean, when you see it, when you Google image mitochondria, you see a sausage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, cut open and showing the crystal and all that. Well, that's misleading. There are some organisms where this is true, but there are many organisms where this is not true. Right. So it's not a sausage, but it's not even a, a link of sausages because in it's a link. It's not even a link of sausages. It's a cross link of sausages. Yeah. Okay. Good <laughs> so, point. Yeah. Nice point, Casey. So his question is How did these phagocytized bacteria acquire the reticulum? Were these started as pili that have since evolved into a reticulum? In addition, why do textbook authors still present the sausage-shaped mitochondria in textbook diagrams as opposed to the reticulum? Why has there not been a greater push in academia to present the mitochondria as a reticulum? <laughs> well, Casey, you're right about the second point. I'm not sure I get the pili point. I don't know what, you, what you're talking about. The pili are extensions from the surface of bacteria. They got lost when mitochondria became uh, what they are, became an organelle. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to amplify on this, there are two possibilities about how this started. One is uh, the first proto-mitochondrion was a bacterium that was swallowed by another, possibly a prokaryote, maybe mm -hmm. not. There's a lot of discussion about that. Whatever. Uh, it was a, something that got swallowed, and it lost a lot of properties, a lot of, lost, a lot of genes, and eventually it learned how to fuse with its neighbors making a, ret a reticulum. The other possibility is that bacteria had known that, that the original bacteria or whatever they were in, in before much evolution took place were actually pretty sloppy. And they, like, they could fuse with each other because they didn't have a complicated outer wall or something like that. So it's, I don't know, you can imagine that the ability to make reticula it's a plural of reticulum, uh, was something that was built in, and that got lost what most of the bacteria was retained in the mitochondria. Mm. Those are two, formally speaking, the two possibilities. I have no idea which one is more plausible. Right. The whole, this whole idea made complete sense when I viewed the mitochondria as a small sausage-shaped alpha proteobacteria. I performed a quick literature search, but was not able to find any literature examining this question. Thank you, and keep up the excellent work. Well, Casey, if you if you look at the paper, the first pa uh, the second paper, you'll see pictures of this reticulum, uh, which they took by staining the mitochondria with a dye. Okay, Cindy writes, "Good morning. I absolutely love listening to you guys. We love we love talking. Yeah. We love talking. <laughs> it <laughs> we matches. Do. We do. <laughs> I've learned so many things from listening to Twim Twiv. Uh, I am sure I will have." be a step ahead when I take my advanced biology classes. One question, though, once a certain strain of bacteria becomes resistant to antibiotics, how much do these antibiotics need to be modified to combat an illness caused by this bacteria that has grown resistant? I have done research on this question, but so far I have not found an answer. I hope you guys can help me out with informing me about this process. Oh, boy. So I guess she well, means that if you get an infection and you're treated and you become resistant... How different is the antibiotic that they have to treat you with? Well, it doesn't have to be that different. I mean, t typically, I think uh, physicians treat, if they fail with one antibiotic, they will use another one from a different class. Right. They may have failed with a, a beta-lactam, they will treat with a fluoroquinolone or something like that. But it doesn't have to be because within each class, sometimes fairly small modifications can change the resistance of the antibiotic to whatever it is that makes the bug resistance. So it's not necessary to do uh, to go far afield. Within one class of antibiotics, you can switch to one that has some chemical modifications which make it resistant to hydrolysis, for instance. Hmm. Offhand, would you know a, a good paper we could send her to to read about this? I think this is sort of part of the general... Mm, literature cool. in most any textbook of microbiology medical microbiology will have a, a good section on this okay all right that's a good question cindy thank you and uh the next one is from jesper who writes the other day i was in a discussion about what can get cancer something that ultimately boiled down to what cancer really is 
our reasoning went along the lines of establishing that there are organisms containing any number of cells ranging from one and up. If I remember correctly, C. elegans has 957 cells. Presumably there is some organism with 956, 955, and so on. It seems it doesn't make any sense to talk about a one-celled organism developing cancer, though I am interested to have that confirmed. The nematode just mentioned has cell specialization, so it could presumably develop some form of cancer. What is the lower limit of cells an organism must have to succumb to the disease, or should the question really be posed in a different way? Also, some organisms of very few cells occasionally gang up and form a superorganism. This includes some slime molds in the pre-larvae state of jellyfish. Can such temporary organisms develop cancer? The question is grander than just parasites, and I have a feeling that viruses, living or not, have no propensity to develop cancer. Hence my addressing the question to TWIM. <laughs> while, while I have your attention, allow me to once again thank you and everyone in each of the podcast teams for your effort and sharing your knowledge and doing it in such an enjoyable tone and fashion. And Jesper is a software architect from Sweden. My mamma mia. Mamma mia. <laughs> uh, it's impressive that a software architect could have such insights into biology. Uh, much of what he says is absolutely right. I think that it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about cancer in a single cell uh, because any modification that the cell would do could be called cancerous or not. So the, the term is just would, would become too vague. You couldn't really use it in that way. About what is the lower limit of an organism to develop cancer? I have no idea. Do you, Vincent? Well, I looked it up. It turns out that C. elegans gets cancer. Uh -huh. It develops tumors. So 957 cells, you know, okay. fish, insects. Sure. I yeah. don't know, smaller than uh, C. elegans. I'm not sure. Mm. You know, I think I if you know. have a special, if you have specialized tissues, you're like exactly. to develop tumors. But exactly. uh, I don't know smaller than C. elegans. Right. But it's a very, it's a very interesting question, right? <laughs> well, you put it very well, Vincent. An organism that has specialized cells is a candidate for something for, for cancer. That's exactly right. So would a jellyfish, uh, uh, oh, the, sure. the uh, could? Yeah, I suppose. I don't, I don't know for sure. I mean, I don't. I never seen cancer in a jellyfish. I go to the aquarium and I look at jellyfish endlessly because they're so fascinating. But yeah. I, I haven't seen one growing, spouting a tumor. So in plants, they uh, these uh, agrobacteria make crown gall sure. tumors, right? right. But that's a tumor of the plant, correct? Right. So, yeah, that's too, a plant is more complex. Good question, Jesper. Whole set of questions, actually. Yeah. Yes, a whole set of them. Uh, if uh, anyone has answers about smaller than C. elegans, let us know. The last one is an email from Stan Malloy, ah. who you know. Well, of course. And I do as too. Stan is an old buddy. I was visiting the University of New Mexico last week and ran into a scientist who said that he loves TWIM. His only complaint was that he commutes a long distance on his bike and sometimes gets so caught up in the discussion that he has nearly avoided an accident. <laughs> Not faint praise from a scientist who is known for being extremely critical. Stan, well, that's very nice. It's lovely. Thank you very lovely. much. I certainly don't, don't want to be uh, involved in people having accidents, but I'm delighted that they listen to Twim. Yeah. I guess it's hard. I would have trouble riding a bike and uh, listening to a podcast. I know. It's difficult. It's a special skill that's multitasking in the yeah. extreme. <laughs> we do Twim every other week, more or less, and you can find it on iTunes or at the Zoom Marketplace or at microbeworld.org slash Twim. iTunes is a nice place to subscribe because you automatically get each new episode. And if you're new to Twim on iTunes, please leave a review there. Just a few words is fine uh, so that we can stay on the front page of the Medicine Podcast directory, and that helps more people listen to us. I would like to ask everyone to go to triplemojo.com slash twiv. We have a listener survey there, which we'd like you to take. We're considering doing some more advertising on our podcasts, and we need to have our listeners fill in a form to tell us what they're like. If you like to listen to Twim on your iPhone or Android device, we do have an app that you can do that with. It's at microbeworld.org slash app. 
finally, we love to get your questions and comments. Please send them to twim at twiv.tv or alternatively, you can go to microworld.org slash twim and leave a comment there. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered, which is written in San Diego and Hawaii, I believe. Thank you, Elio. That's right. Oh, my pleasure. uh, For uh, having a conversation with me today. I'm sorry we missed our other colleagues, but they'll be back next time. I am Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. And what did you say, Elio? You have been blogging for five years now? Five years. It'll be five years in another two weeks. Well, what are you going to do special for that anniversary? (laughs) Write a blog post, uh, right? (laughs) Yeah, I'll write about what it means to me to blog. It's been a wonderful experience, and I'd like to I'd like to share it with our readers. I think that's a good idea. Can I just ask you how you started blogging? Well, it was interesting. In my retirement, I wanted to stay in science, mm-hmm. and my outlet for that would be to write, because I like to write. And so where do I write? Well, you know, there are very few places where you could. There are, I, I would write a commentary on something every so often and publish it maybe twice a year. So I, I didn't have an outlet for that. So I then discovered blogs, which in my old age was something so totally un, unheard of and unusual. And in effect, in, in a way of putting, I mean, the word blog didn't really sound too good to an octogenarian. Well, I wasn't quite that, but almost. Anyhow, so I, but I looked into it and I thought blog is the thing for me. So then I called the ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, and I talked to Chris Kandoyan, who does uh, such wonderful work in this, blog, in this podcast. And I said, well, can you advise me on that? He says, you wouldn't believe it. We just talked about wanting a blog sponsored by ASM. Mm. So why don't we get together? So this is how it happened. And it was a marriage made in heaven. So you started initially on your own, right? I started on my own. And then uh, after a couple of posts, I get an email from Mary Yule, lady in Hawaii, it turned out, who said, oh, she had wanted to do the same thing, but she liked mine. So instead, could she help me? She started to help me. And then <laughs> in no time... It turned out that her editing was so formidable, so unbelievable, that I felt she was literally getting into my head, crawling around my brain, getting out the idea I wanted and writing it down. <laughs> but this is unbelievable. And so she has then started to write for the blog, and now we own it together. It's a joint effort. We're co-equals in the blog. And to work with Mary has been just a gift from heaven. Uh, talk about symbiosis. Man, this is the ultimate symbiosis that I know of. So it's a mutual symbiosis, right? And, well, I hope she gets something out of it. I guess she does. <laughs> I certainly do. <laughs> That's wonderful. Small things considered. If you haven't checked it out, you need to do that. There's a, a link. If you click Alio's name in the show notes, you will get there right away. I want to thank uh, ASM for their support of TWIM. TWIM is a ASM, just like they wanted a blog, Alio. They decided they wanted a podcast. Oh yeah, that's and fine. that is what Twim is. So you're you're working on both uh, activities for ASM. <laughs> and I want to thank uh, communication director Barbara Hyde and Chris Condian and Ray Ortega for helping us out in all sorts of ways that uh, I can't even begin to enumerate. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on this week in microbiology. 